sleep. We all talk about it. We all want more of it. What we know for sure is that most of us aren't getting enough of it. And it's affecting our health in a very big way. What you need to know about sleep is it's a very important part of your life. It's what you do all day long that sets you up either for a good night's sleep or a bad one. We have to take it seriously and sleeping pills are generally evil. I'm Dr. Danielle Martin, family physician and vice president at Women's College Hospital. I'm Dr. Samir Sinha and I'm a geriatrician and the director of geriatrics at Sinai Health System and the University Health Network. I'm Dr. Shelley Weiss, a pediatric neurologist and sleep specialist at the Hospital for Sick Children and the University of Toronto. Yeah, we all need it. We don't all get it. That is sleep in a nutshell. And here's a number to frame all of this. So according to a national poll, almost 60% of Canadians would say they're not getting enough sleep. Maybe you're one of them. So let's start with the basics and the impact of not getting enough sleep. And so Shelly, you work with kids every day. And, and you know, parents, I think, intuitively know that if their kids do get enough sleep, then they're, they'll be sharper, they'll be brighter, they'll, they'll be in a better mood. What else do we need to know? Sure, so it's not just parents. There's really good science that lets us know that children who are chronically sleep deprived, so not getting enough sleep for you know many days, uh, they'll have problems with memory, learning, attention, behavior. There can also be effects on the immune function. Obviously, they're not going to exercise because they're going to be tired. So a whole lot of effects from not getting enough sleep when and, you're a child. And if you, I guess, progress, I mean, into adult so, so what are the other, a lot of the same concerns would also apply. Of course, I mean, I think we all intuitively know that our mental health is deeply linked to our sleep, both when you're not feeling well mentally or emotionally, that will affect your sleep and vice versa. Our social interactions, our capacity to concentrate and, you know, perform well at work. And then there's all kinds of physical and physiologic functions that sleep serves, including uh, memory and the way that your brain stores information. There's a lot of background work happening in the brain as you sleep um, and a lot of repair going on and healing all throughout the body of different kinds. Samir, as you, as you get even older, yeah. um, so first of all, if we're talking about seniors, how many hours of sleep do they actually need mm -hmm. per night? Really, if you feel well rested in the morning, you feel like you got a good sleep, then you're doing okay. It's just important for people to remember that as you get older, um, you don't sleep as deeply as you used to. So you might have more interrupted sleep. Your sleep might not be as longer. But the key is it's still important to get a good night's sleep as an older person because if you wake up tired and fatigued, it might affect your memory. And especially if you have some memory concerns or you might have some physical concerns, it could increase and diminish, your, diminish some of your senses and increase your risk of falling and other problems. Problems too. According to the Canadian Institute for Health Information, one in 10 seniors take sleeping pills. Now, we have a question here. This is coming from Crystal from Yukon. And, and as you'll see, she's not a senior herself, but she has a question that will be applicable to a lot of people. So have a listen. Hi there, I live in the Yukon and I've got a quick question about sleep and specifically prescription sleep medication. I can generally fall asleep no problem, but the issue is that I wake up all night long. I wake up and I feel very tired and super groggy. So the doctor has given me some prescription sleep medication. But my question is, am I actually getting a proper good night's sleep? Am I actually sleeping? Or am I more in a, like a mini drug induced coma? Anyhow, thanks so much for your help. Well, thank you for the question, Crystal. So, Samir, let me let you handle that question. The challenge of sleeping pills, especially in older adults, is they can affect, um, they can make you groggy and feel more drugged in the morning, which can affect your thinking and memory, but also can significantly increase your risk of falling. That's why we try and avoid sleeping pills, but, especially in the elderly. But what do you mean affect you in the morning? But, because if you're taking them the night before. Yeah, because the key is, you know, th if there's a perfect medication that lasts exactly the length of sleep that you have, <laughs> right. then that would be a miracle medication. But right now, what I always say to my patients is that even though you wake up at 8 a.m., that medication may still be in your system for up to 24 hours. And that's where those that's where those things can be especially problematic in older adults. But even younger people, when they take sleeping pills, they find that eh, it doesn't necessarily do the trick. We have another uh, question that, that Jay in Ontario recorded for us. Have a listen to this. Hi there, my name is Jay and I am from Ontario. And my question about sleep is, can cannabis help you sleep through the night? 
Okay, so Danielle, maybe I'll throw that one to you. I mean, you know, speaking of sleep aids, cannabis. Sure, that this distance? is a common form of self-medication, right? And not just cannabis, but alcohol as well. People yeah, sure. will often say that uh, they find having uh, having cannabis in whatever form, or you know, a drink of some kind before they go to sleep, helps them to relax and go to sleep. And that may be true that it helps to, uh, helps to initiate sleep. But we, what we know is that the quality of that sleep may not be the same. And so uh, very often people won't wake up feeling as refreshed or as rested as they would if they had fallen asleep on their own steam, so to speak. The, we know a lot more about alcohol than we do about cannabis. You know, it's an emerging field of research. There's a lot still that we don't know. Um, but, but for now, there's no good evidence that it's a safe or effective way to help you to get a good night's sleep. Right. The, the fact that you feel tired or aren't getting enough sleep, that actually just may be a sign of some under... Of something else going on. And so, you know, sometimes we need to get under to the next layer down to try to figure that out. Shelley, what's your take on, on ensuring a, a proper and effective sleep environment? And so we know that children and adults sleep better in a cool, comfortable, dark, quiet room. Obviously also safe, but a space, especially for children, where they feel safe and all those conditions are met is going to lead to the optimal sleep. There's another question that I want to get to if we can. So this is from uh, Elizabeth in London. Have a listen. Hi. My question is this. Does the support quality and the temperature of a pillow have any bearing on the, on the quality of your sleep? I use a buckwheat hole pillow and I find it cool and, and moves with my body, so I've, I'm getting great results. So thanks. Bye. So I actually think this is a really interesting question. So I... No one knows this about me, probably, but I don't sleep with a pillow at all mm -hmm. because I, I just find it so uncomfortable. It gets hot and it's it's just gross and it, it doesn't help oh. me sleep. So, so speaking to that environment question, I mean the pillow, but the mattress too, right? All these things. So what are your thoughts on that? Sure. So the most important thing is comfort. And the other important thing, especially for children, is that the environment is the same when they fall asleep as when they wake up at night, because we all wake up several times at night. Some people think we just were either awake or we're asleep, but actually that's not how sleep works. Sleep is a very complicated, uh, we have a very complicated architecture in our brains when we're sleeping. So we uh, cycle through periods of sleep. The important thing is that every time we wake up, we will fall back to sleep very quickly if everything is the same. So if you have a buckwheat pillow or you have no pillow, that doesn't matter as long as the environment is the same as when you fell asleep the first time. Oh, interesting. Uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about these fun right. little devices. Yeah. I, I know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm guilty entirely. Uh, my bedtime ritual is to lie down, I plug in my phone, <laughs> and I'm literally lying there mm -hmm. and just kind of surfing the web or, or on Instagram or on Twitter. And I'm sure it's terrible for me, and yet I do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not good. It's not good. And <laughs> I'm equally guilty. I will admit okay, it on national TV. You're not alone. Um, and in fact, you know, and, and it, really, it really reminds us that we have to treat our sleep time with respect. It's the tweets and the stimulation, and especially with teenagers, you know, not having the sort of insight to turn off those electronics and realize how important sleep is. I have to ask you about naps, mm -hmm. because this is something that... that a lot of people do. Um, is there a, well, first of all, let me start. Are, are naps a good idea? Ought you be taking So in, in general, the answer is it's best not to nap. Of course, there are exceptions to that. I'm not saying that you can never enjoy a brief nap, but we seem to have this belief in our culture that we can do everything that you know doesn't prepare us, including napping for two hours in the middle of the day, and then we're shocked when it comes time to go to bed at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night and it's difficult for us to do that. And so mm -hmm. thinking about sleep is something that you're preparing for through the day, not something that kicks in at 11 p.m. is part of, the, part of the battle. But it can feel sometimes like getting enough sleep is this insurmountable problem, right? So, so okay, I, I'm not getting enough sleep, so I could do what? I could try to exercise better, I could change my diet, I can change the pillow, I could change the mattress, I could put my phone away, I could try to de-stress, I could try to meditate and, and not think about other things. But it's hard to know which 
if any of these solutions is actually going to produce the result that you're trying to get, which is to ultimately get better sleep. I mean, the answer is you start with the thing that, that distresses you the most. And, you know, for you, that might be about setting a regular bedtime. And for me, it might actually be less about sleep and more about making sure that I get more regular exercise and for Samir it might be what he's eating or whatever so each of us needs to start from where we are but I think we need to see these things as linked to one another your sleep is not so separate from your diet and your you know, your nutritional choices and your exercise choices and the way that you choose to live other parts of your life all of these things are about you know building towards a healthier happier existence for all of us. It's interesting because as I work with my older patients and I and I let people know that you know there's no magic amount of time but the goal is to get a, a good sleep and then I'd always you know recite the these are the things you should do and then you know after I turn 40 I'm like I really need to do these things and they really do work. <laughs> so you know true, yeah. and you know and it's not a prescription it's not a pill it's just about learning to respect that sleep just like your diet and exercise you have to put a bit of effort in to get a good return on investment. So, so final question, picking up on that last thought of respect for sleep. I mean, do we really need to fundamentally rethink the, the value that we put on sleep? Because I, I think of, of lots of people who I know, myself included, who occasionally brag about the lack of sleep that they get, that it's a sort of badge of honor. It's a sign that, that you work so hard and you're so ambitious and you get lots of stuff done all at great personal sacrifice. Does, does mm. that need to just be completely turned on its head? I think the important word you said was occasional. So occasionally, nobody's gonna sleep well every night. Occasional is okay. It's the people who are missing sleep on a more chronic basis or are unhappy with their sleep on a more chronic basis that uh, where there really is a problem. We may pretend, you know, that it's a badge of honor, but actually we worry about it and think about it a lot. And one of the good things about a conversation like this is that it reminds us that a lot of this stuff is in our control. There's a lot that we can each be doing. Um, it's not actually that hard to do. Danielle, Shelley, Samir, very insightful, wonderful to talk to you. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.